there were certain records which were always quite emotional for me. And I remember there's um, one record I really loved was um, Kenny Burke, Rising to the Top. As a DJ, when you play a record, it gives you like, makes the hair on your arm raise and it gives you goosebumps. And that club was in the basement, it was so hot and everyone would just be grinding, just whining all night that you, you, you see mist appear on the record because it was just so hot and humid and soaking in that club. Those records would just create that mist on that vinyl and you know you were just ripping. Yo, it's Tim Westwood out of the UK, Crate Diggers. Let's get into it. You'd have to have a box of dubs, man, if you were serious in the game. So this is an old Sprague Benz on the Frog Rhythm and the Dig Out the Red, Lick Off the Head. That was a big, like, reggae record at the time. And what it is, that this artist, like, this is Reggie Stepper on the Stalag Rhythm, and this is Kuchunu with his record, but what he'd do, he'd voice this record and make it entirely about me. It'd be like, uh, like tuning a record of his that he's made about whatever into a song about me. So he'd put my name in the song. And then when I'd be playing in a club, on a sound system, I could play this as, you know, to big myself up. And if it was The Clash, I'd win. Well, I started going to clubs. I used to go to clubs like seven nights a week when I first came to London. Like, just loved nightclubs, man. Just loved the whole environment, the whole experience. It was just like, just to find who I was, it was just so exciting. And then eventually got a job in a club and that was collecting glasses. Working there, there was like a lot of different varieties of what was happening over, you know, different nights. But on a Saturday, there was this uh, legendary DJ from the UK called uh, David Rodigan. And just growing up in that environment, it was just the most exciting thing in my life. I just fell in love with the music, fell in love with the scene, the whole environment. And there was another legendary club at that period called um, the People's Club. And I used to go there a lot as a kid. And then I ended up DJing there and I had like a legendary night there on a Thursday for years and it used to start like at 10 at night, but you know, get busy at four in the morning and shut like 10, 12 the next day. Parade Street is an area was like a lot of, like, you know, a lot of like prostitutes, hoes and that. So all the pimps were down there and just growing up in that environment, it was like, yo, this is just this whole different world. It was just like the most fun I've ever had in my life. But I was, I was just a young kid. I was like 18 or whatever. And um, that started me as, as DJ. I used to earn 15 pounds a night. I used to have my records and cardboard boxes. I used to be on the night bus, coming home, carrying them. And it was just like really hectic. For the gigs, this is how we used to travel to the gigs. Like we used to carry these, these are like four crates. So you'd, you'd need a team. At the time, the office was on the fourth floor. We didn't even have stairs. I uh, didn't even have a lift rather, crazy. And this is, uh, that's how much that sh weighs. And this is like how we'd be ripping it down, man. These are as they were. So yeah, so you'd be ripping through here, man, to, to find some records. See, this is the era. This is um, Jeeps, Lex, Coops, uh, Beamers and Benz, Lost Boys. This was the main set, man. I'd be ripping joints, baby. Ripping joints in here, man. Records which would have spun a lot are the records which are like you know, really dogged out. So these joints here, they would have been in the crates and they go like that in the crates because um, when you're resting them on the crates, that's the side. So, you know, they're in the crate, you put them up like that to play or have their, and that's how they get worn here. And then there's always two copies. And then, you know, that's how they get, you know, badly treated. This is like uh, Raekwon criminology. This would be really spinning big in the clubs. Um, like I was never a DJ who like used to mark where the points were. I used to have it labeled what side to play. That was the easiest for me with to throw a joint on. When I first started out, like it, it was like back when like Rapper's Delight had just come out. And um, I was one of the places, I was running around with a sound system called JB's. It was like a PA system for hire. And they, um, there was a big radio event for a station which was called Radio London that they used to do in Kilburn. I used to help them set up or I used to go there mad early with them. And um, Quite often, like before the main DJs arrived and before there was anyone in there, 
I, I could just play the records. So I'd just have a little bag of records to play those, even though there was no one in there, even it was just as the club was opening. That thrill I can still remember to this day. That gave me the real taste for it. So in here, this is, this is all hip hop in here. Like everything is hip hop. It used to be alphatized, might have got lost along the way, but it used to be pretty accurately alphatized. I had people who come around and start pulling shit out, and when they pull shit out, the covers don't go back properly. So that drives me friggin' insane. But apart from that, it's a small thing. Okay, let's go through the other room. Uh -huh. In this back room here, all this is reggae. Across here, this is reggae. Big labels like were green sleeves. They were classic. Green sleeves had all the hits. And then there was another label called Dub Vendor which put out a lot of hits. So, that, so that's reggae. And then over here is um, just more hip hop. And then, you know, these are joints which used to get used a lot, you know, Jay-Z, like a lot of Rockefeller. So yeah, that's in here. And then lastly, more hip hop records. And then in those crates and crates of cardboard boxes are the seven inch pre's. I mean, I've got a lot of records. My, my thing was, is that I was a working DJ and, you know, it was only records in those days. Like you had to have records and records were incredibly expensive. So like a 12 inch single in this country, it was like 12 pounds. But back then I was earning 15 pounds for the night. So you could understand like how expensive this was. And you could understand like, yo, if, if there was heat out there and you had to buy it, best you don't buy the wrong records. And I, I used to buy doubles, triples, just because th these records were so rare and so important to me. What the reggae artists do is that they'll have a hot rhythm and there might be 10 artists who voice on it. And you've got to choose the hits because you're not going to play 10 versions of that one rhythm. You might play three and you're in the shop listening to records and like they have such, like if you don't buy them then and there, those reggae records you can't buy. They've, just, they've gone, and that's the end of the run. They might come back in a month's time, but if you're a hot DJ, you need that. So you'd be in there under tremendous pressure to, to buy the hits. Tremendous, because if you miss them then, you miss them. When I first started in the Reggae Man, the biggest thing over here was called Lover's Rock, and that was our UK version of uh, like, sort of sweet, soulful reggae. And there was like classic artists out of the UK. Lover's Rock was never big in Jamaica. And the problem with a lot of those Jamaican records is that they used to repress the vinyl, but the problem when they repress the vinyl, they never used to take the paper off it. So they would just heat up the vinyl with the paper still on it from this label. And so a lot of those pre's kept, used to be mad thick and not great quality because they had paper melted in to the vinyl because when they just recycled the vinyl. And another thing which was real big with reggae was the uh, 10 inch single. I don't know where this came from, but like that was the classic 10 inch single. They used to really love rocking it. To be honest, in those early days, the majority of dub plates were on 10 inch with two tracks aside. So it was just cheaper to get 10 inches done. And then they started releasing vinyl as 10 inch. When I used to go to the States in those early days, I was a super fiend because you could get all the, uh, the, the breakbeat records in there breakbeats, you know, the old school compilations. They're, they're, they're digging in the crates, volume one to 20 or whatever. Those, those bootleg compilations of records like the meters and the shit that you need to cut up for the rappers and cut up for the break dancers. So when I used to go to the States, I was a super fiend shopper. So, you know, these were really big for me, man. These, um, this is what I was going to the States to get, these ultimate breaks and beats, man. You, you, you can't front about this. And on, on the back of these, these had all the like, the, the early breakbeat records that used to play in, in the clubs. You know, records like The Mexican, uh, NT, Let a Woman uh, Be a Woman, Let a Man Be a Man. You know, the records used to cut up for the break dancers and the rappers. So th this is what a lot of my New York shopping was, man. Spent mad dough on that. I used to bring back 
Crates are going to have to get arrested at customs for smuggling in records, not paying duty. Going through the do not declare section, trying to stir your trolley, which is just way laid with crates of records and suitcases of records, trying to steer your trolley away from the customs guys and then them calling over you and then them just opening all your shit, searching for receipts and making you pay extra paper so much that you can't pay that day and you have to go back up to the airport to get your records out after you pay the duty and the fines. So my, my digging era was super done uh, in the States. And I was hanging out with like Marley Marl at a BLS, hanging out with Marley Marl at his crib when he was making records with the likes of, you know, up in Mount Vernon making records with the likes of, you know, those old cold chilling artists. So blessed. This, this was classic, this was classic. Uh, we were like massive, massive cold chilling fans. And this is the early days when it was on a label called Prism and uh, Ace in Action. We used to love an artist called Master Ace. He was like the second generation of cold chilling artists. And this is Letter to the Better. I thought this artist was straight ripping, man. This is like all pre when they had the cold chilling deal with uh, Atlantic Records. And this is Picking Boogers. You know, sometimes they used to try and take these covers up Next Plateau was another great label. The artist Ultramatic MC is real big, real big over here. This is like pre Wu Tang classic. During the era of Rare Groove, you know, things were going, but I'd, I've not spent hundreds and hundreds of records. I never had to do that. There was one record called um, Funky Rasta. I don't know, there was a, a sound system which became a group called Soul to Soul. And um, they, they, they used to have this little slogan, uh, what was it, a happy face, pumping bass, a loving race, that was their little slogan. And then when I was in the States, I found this record called Funky Rasta. And um, they were so mad at me that I had this record and they didn't, because it was, could have been like theme music for them. And so I actually licensed the record for the UK. So that's probably the most I've ever spent on a record was licensing the friggin' sh and then releasing it over here. Um, which was crazy. This was this Justice that was our label. See, like that imagery of the, the Uzi, like that was an era when, you, you know, I don't know, like public enemy era, you know, it was pretty cool to have an Uzi on your goddamn label. Like, not now. This is an artist called General Levy. He was a UK artist that we put out. Our biggest, probably our best record was one called Money Mad by London Posse. But the thing with them, um, that was like, this was some hip hop reggae, which is like, you know, it was, don't get me wrong, it was ripping in the clubs, baby. Real big over, real big over here. Profile, that was like early days. That was real standard. This is Disco Twins and Star Child D. Do the WAP. Yeah. We had an era called Rare Groove here, where real, Old obscure records became very popular in clubs, playing like old soul music as part of the night. If you didn't have it, you, you were destroyed. And I, I was even DJing at um, the People's Club. And how, how that was set up, it was like mad dark. There'd be one little red light in the club at one end, and then the bar would be lit at the other end. And people would be really, you know, there's a lot of cocaine smoking in those days. So there would be like a white cloud in front of you, which would be there from about two in the morning till about midday the next morning. It would be crazy. And, and, and it didn't have a license, it didn't have a license for anything. I remember DJing and, and I was like, did I put that record away or oh, not to worry? Put the next record. And there was somebody at the front who was actually, as the record finished and I played the next record, was, was stealing my friggin' records. Mm -hmm. And it was by the time I got to the second one, it was like, yo, what the f is going on? I ain't putting these records away. And I suddenly realized, because we was like, the crowd was like, there was, you know, I was just on a little step DJ. And like, uh, like I remember that massive drama that night. But like, yeah, that's how sought after these records were. Down in Hammersmith, just down the road here, there used to be a pub called The Clarendon, and they used to have record fairs there. And there'd be regular violence at these record fairs of people finding a record and like two people trying to get that, that rare record and like just blows. People rushing the store, stealing people's records. It was like those days, like music was such a scarce, expensive commodity. It was no joke. 
what this kind of represents is, is sort of like, this is, this is all my history. I lived in rented accommodation all my life. If you look at how much money I've spent, if these pieces like were 12 pounds each, the albums would be 18, 20 pounds in those days. Like this just represents like, yo, I could have bought myself a crib if I hadn't been spending everything I was earning, borrowing money, borrowing my money, using every bit of money I had to, to buy this. This crib here sums up like that era of, of my life, my heritage, of my music, and, and that's the truth of it.